Well, welcome everyone. Um, I'm going to get started. So thank you all for hopping into this webinar. Really excited to be here with you all today. Uh, my name is Drew Buchanan. I am the engineering manager here at True Insight. Um, if you're unfamiliar with who True Insight is, we are a channel partner with Altair. And I'm going to be giving some tips and tricks today on HyperMesh. So really excited to be here. Um, one thing I'm going to do is I'm just going to kick off um, just a poll. Um, so while I kind of just go over a couple of these intro slides, if you feel, uh, if you could answer some of the questions I'm, I'm, I'm showing, that would be great. Um, so first thing, if you're unfamiliar with who Altair is, um, Altair is a high-end CAE company. Um, really, their goal is to help designers and engineers to really utilize simulation, um, HPC, and AI to kind of make these decisions. Um, I know we're focusing in on HyperMesh today and really kind of getting in the weeds with terms of tips and tricks. Um, but, uh, you know, if you're unaware of the tools, um, definitely reach out. My colleague um, is going to be in the chat, so we'll save some questions uh, and some time at the end for questions. But as I'm going through this presentation, feel free to shoot out, shoot some questions and, and let me know. Uh, he, he'll be able to answer them in the chat. So the first thing I'll point out um, within the actual Altair suite, something that makes us very unique. Um, I see a lot of people on the poll questions that there are some active HyperMesh users um, that are using it daily, or, um, weekly, um, some who have never used it and some are using it sparingly. One of the things to keep in mind, like if your company has multiple seats of HyperMesh, maybe um, that might be the only tool you're familiar with, but actually when you purchase a license of Altair, it gives you access to a number of other tools. So, um, you know, maybe you're using another solver or another tool in pre-processing of HyperMesh, uh, but you may have enough units to actually take advantage of our solvers or some other tools um, within the suite. So I think that's something that's unique. You may not be aware of if you do have questions about what tools you have access to, um, definitely reach out to us um, or your account manager. Um, they'll be able to let you know um, what that is and, and what tools you have access to. So um, our agenda today um, will first be focusing in on HyperWorks HyperMesh. Um, really, I think one thing just to be aware of, I'm gonna be kind of using the new interface. Some of you guys may be using it, some of you may not, and talk about the advantages of the new interface. Um, we'll jump into geometry tips. You know, one of the most useful things within HyperMesh is some of the advanced geometry capabilities within the tool. Um, and then we'll look at some meshing. Obviously, this is a short webinar. It's 45 minutes. It's not going to, I'm not going to be able to cover every single feature, uh, but hopefully you'll kind of get some new tips um, within the actual uh, demonstration. And, and keep in mind, we're recording this. So if there's something I go over and you don't um, catch it in time. We're going to be putting this up on our YouTube page. Um, and lastly, we'll close it out with any questions. Like I said, um, if you do have questions as I'm going through this, my colleague will answer them. If he can't answer them, then I can answer them at the end. So uh, let's first talk about HyperWorks HyperMesh. So some of you who are legacy HyperMesh users, um, you may be aware of what HyperWorks is, or maybe you may not. Um, one of the things to be aware of, um, uh, you know, like six or seven years ago, uh, uh, Altair kind of went through the process of bringing a new interface into play, something that would be more user intuitive and have a better user experience than the classic HyperMesh interface. So everything I'm going to be working today is actually going to be based around HyperMesh um, using pre-processing, but I'm going to be using it in the new interface, HyperWorks. Um, the new interface actually has a lot of capabilities. So being um, an engine, uh, a legacy HyperMesh user, it took me a little bit of time to kind of jump over, uh, but kind of when I made that transition and those of you who are watching this webinar, I encourage you to come over. I'll kind of give you some tips on to kind of keep the kind of the classic features of the old interface, but there are advantages that I, I do like within the new interface. So every single feature is there. Now keep in mind, um, and if you want to continue using the old interface, that's totally fine. Um, that, that, you know, uh, Altair is not getting rid of that. Uh, but one of the things you can do within the new interface um, is you can actually add panels um, if you want to go that route. Um, the new interface, what they did is they actually introduced ribbons and icons, um, which makes the user experience a lot better. And some of the actual ribbon commands are things that aren't actually found in the classic interface. Um, so 
there are there are some advantages uh, coming to the new interface in that regard. Um, very similar to the old interface, um, HyperWorks is a multi-physics environment. So you can access HyperView, HyperGraph, HyperMesh, Motion View, et cetera, um, within the tool. Um, that being said, I think it's just, let's just jump in and kind of take a look at this new interface. So um, one of the first things I'll point out, you'll kind of see at the top, which is a little bit different than how things are arranged, um, uh, is we have an active ribbon window. Now note some of the things that people liked about Hy HyperMesh we still have. You know, we still have a page layout icon right here where you can specify, you know, multiple pages like you would have in the classic interface. But, you know, we now actually have icons showing. Um, a couple other things to point out, you know, the classic HyperMesh had like an icon where you could change it to motion view uh, and whatnot. Now it's a lot easier in terms of where it's at. It just, um, you know, you kind of go up right next to the view icon. See how it says HyperMesh? If I click on it, I can change it to HyperView or HyperGraph or Motion View, et cetera, like you would have in the old classic interface. Um, a couple things you'll see right here. You have your file open browser, um, measure, and then all the different ribbon commands, which we'll be stepping our way through in this presentation. Um, a couple other things, like I said, um, if you're a legacy kind of HyperMesh user, you're still using the old interface. One of the things that may make your life easier um, is you can go turn on the panels, view panels, and then you can have the old panel interface in here within the new kind of GUI and, and construct. Um, if we go to file, um, we'll see right here, I still have the, the, the classic capabilities of being able to import, you know, all the different file formats, solver decks. HyperWorks is still uh, solver agnostic, meaning that we can import different solver decks. Uh, all the same formats you would have in the classic interface. Um, and we also have the capability to export um, out as well. So everything you have right here um, in terms of the system. And then one of the other key things that a lot of you guys may be doing is you may be actually, you know, working within a different solver interface. You know, we still have that feature. So like, for instance, maybe you're working with an Ansys or Abacus. Uh, Abacus explicit, et cetera, we can change those. Again, it just makes the user experience a little bit nicer. Um, for the sake of this webinar, I'm gonna be focusing in on uh, just basic OptiStruct. And I'm gonna kind of step through a couple kind of overview commands here, just so you're aware of. Um, one of the kind of first cool things I'll point out, um, things are very easy to drag and drop into the GUI. Um, so if I wanna drop this file directly into the GUI, I can, you know, obviously I can open it as well. Uh, but we see right here, we have a very large file. Um, one of the things that's really nice in terms of organization is they've actually kind of made the organization features even more user intuitive coming to the, the, new, the new platform. But kind of my first tip I'll point out here um, is we kind of see our, our area right here in terms of our model tree. This may look very familiar if, if you're doing CAD work to a model tree in, um, in CAD. Um, and then we have our components showing here. One thing I'll typically do in the new interface, you know, this is a very large assembly, it's an automobile. One of the cool things you can do is you can click on uh, a component and hit Q. And that's just uh, a handy review mode. So it, it automatically turns everything into wire mesh. Uh, I'm sorry, a wireframe view. And then you can, you know, you know, uh, click on a command and, and, and show it. Um, so that's the Q button. Um, you can also access that by right clicking and specifying um, Q under review. It's a really helpful way of being able to understand what's happening in your system. Um, a couple other really nice things, um, as far as mouse controls, one of the common things that I'd run into with legacy HyperMesh users was kind of having to hold the control key to use the mouse commands. They've eliminated that. Now, if you really like that feature, one of the cool things you can do is you can go to your file preferences um, and then go to mouse controls and go back to legacy. Um, but you can also start setting your mouse controls. The mouse controls, um, the how they're set is um, the middle scroll wheel zooms in and out, very logical. Um, the right mouse button pans. Um, and then if you click on the middle mouse button, it rotates around. So very uh, analogous to um, uh, some of our other tools, but also similar to some CAD tools. It makes the, the user experience a little bit nicer. One of the other really nice things is you have a, a, it's a lot easier to kind of create some custom views. Again, these are things you could do within the classic interface, but they weren't as quick. 
So say, you know, I'm zooming in on a component here um, and I actually create um, maybe a custom view. I can click on this little snapshot icon right here. Um, and then what I can do is click, you know, new picture. And then I can say, I don't know, let's just name it demo. And you see, I already have one. Um, and then let's kind of just go to a different view. So if I click on view right here and select isometric, I can then go to my camera view and then you kind of see it, there's the demo automatically goes back. I, I kind of saved the preview as well. So it really makes things very easy in terms of how you're approaching your different viewpoints. Um, some of the other things you'll notice here down at the bottom, um, it's very easy in terms of dynamically creating cross sections. Um, another thing that was kind of enhanced with the user experience, if I click on the little stapler icon, it's a cross section. Um, but the cross section actually allows you to really easily kind of create these cross sections. So maybe I want to create one cross section in that direction. And then maybe I want to go in the X direction. So now I actually have kind of a dynamic cross section view and it's very easy to turn these on and off. So um, some great visualization commands there um, that you have at your disposal. Um, kind of the last thing I'll talk about the interface for those of you coming up to speed with it. Um, there's a great little search bar up here at the top. So obviously I suggested, you know, if you're coming in, I suggest coming up to the date with this, you can turn on the panels where you can probably find a lot of the commands. Uh, but you can also um, you know, click on the little magnifying glass here at the top and then type in a command. So let's say we're, we're, gonna, look, we're gonna talk about stitching in a moment. Um, so if I hit stitch, it's gonna tell me where this is organized. So it's under geometry and there'll be an icon for stitch. Um, so you see, oh, geometry ribbon. Oh, there's an icon for stitch, great. Um, I could also, you know, search for stitch, you know, if I wanted to, and then actually, you know, click on the command, it would open up the command automatically. So you see how it automatically turns on that command for me. So that's another kind of useful thing, kind of helps you kind of come up to speed with the tool um, in terms of getting up and ready. Um, kind of the last thing I'll point out, which is pretty neat, is the entity selector. Um, classic um, hypermesh, um, didn't necessarily have a quick selection tool for entities. You, you have to access it from kind of the, the left-hand portion. In this case, it's right here in the GUI. And then I can turn on, instead of looking at components, so if I click on a component, it's gonna grab that specific component. I can turn it to say like elements, and then I can then go select elements. Um, and then maybe if I even want to, I can do a box select, um, which is the default, but I can change that easily if I right click and select maybe circle select, and then I can do circle select. So you kind of still have those same commands in terms of you know freehand select. You know that was something that was really kind of handy in an old hypermesh interface. But you had those commands with kind of a, a greater user experience uh, within the tool. All right, so that's kind of a quick overview. I'm gonna pop back to my my slide deck here, and then we'll kind of start digging into some geometry and uh, mesh tips. So before we do that, I think one of the things you should be aware of, and uh, you know, there's a lot of people in here, some of her are not using HyperMesh often, some of you guys are power users. Um, it's really one of the really powerful things about HyperMesh is its geometry capabilities. Um, all of you guys probably, maybe some of you are doing some CAD work, or if you're just an analyst, you're getting work fed to you from a designer, but more often than not, you're not always going to be responsible for you know, creating the CAD. So you're going to be importing that CAD into HyperMesh and then setting your mesh up um, to, to be run for you know, FEA, your injection molding, CFD, et cetera. Um, so it's important to kind of understand the topology. So when things get brought in to HyperMesh, um, the geometry is imported in, and then it recognizes the surfaces, the edges, and the individual points. So it's important to note within topology, um, you know, you can't necessarily move an edge from a surface. You can't kind of dissociate a, a point from a surface, but you can kind of manipulate those points and edges. Just they have to be always tied to that surface. Um, so one of the things that is super, super powerful when I started using HyperMesh years ago um, was the topology capabilities. This was really kind of always such a problem. Initially, when I started out, I was using um, Abacus years ago in graduate school. Um, and it would be such a pain in the butt because I'd be getting fed a CAD model from somebody else um, and I'd have to kind of figure out where that CAD was kind of, uh, you know, why there was issues in terms of meshing. And a lot of times I'd even go back and have to resketch the CAD and be a very 
large waste of time. I'm sure you guys probably have run into that. But within HyperMesh, we have topology uh, tools, which helps us illustrate um, where the, you might have bad geometry. And when I say bad geometry, when you look at this part here, um, a shared edge makes sense. That means it's an edge that's being shared by two surfaces on a fillet. You'll see in some of the examples I worked through, there might be you know, something that should be a shared edge that's showing as a red edge, meaning that it's not that edge is not connected to the other surface. It's not stitching to that surface. So these topology um, tools allow us to kind of work our way through and visualize what's happening um, within the system. So red can, red's not necessarily bad, if red's, but if red's connected to two surfaces, it's bad. It means those two surfaces aren't being stitched together. But in the case here, it makes sense because red is just one surface, it's the end. And this is totally fine, but so it's, I don't wanna make you think that red's always bad. It just red is bad if it's connected, if it's, it should have uh, two surfaces connected, that should be green. Uh, yellow is a T-junction and then blue is a suppressed edge. Um, uh, we'll kind of visualize those things when we jump into the tool. All right, so let me hop out of here. Um, I'm gonna jump into some specific uh, geometry tips. Let's file open. All right, great. All right, so um, in your case, you guys are gonna be probably, you know, bringing in geometry into hypermesh. Um, one of the things I, I'll, I'll always do, the first thing I'll, I'll, I'll kind of take a look at, and let me turn off the panels view here, um, is I'll go to my geometry ribbon, and there's a number of commands we can take advantage of as we work our way through, but probably the most advantageous thing, if you guys aren't in the habit of doing this, is clicking on the stitch button. The stitch button will actually automatically turn on topology. Uh, topology is kind of what that, that slide I was just showing you if things should make sense. So if I zoom in here, um, kind of see here's a, a perfect example of a bad kind of um, geometry. So right here, I have this fillet connected to this surface right here, but it's showing a red edge, meaning that these surfaces aren't connected. So um, we know this is one part, so it should be connected. This is not kind of a separate part or, or a non-shared surface. So we wanna stitch these together. If we try to mesh this, you may have, you're gonna have either meshing difficulties or bad element density, and it's gonna become a very weird model. So typically the things I'll look for is I'll make sure I have everything turned on and make sure everything makes sense. Um, one of the other kind of tips I'll utilize is I'll turn on when you activate the stitch command, um, I can hit only and you'll see everything that's in red. Okay, this looks pretty good, but can I kind of visualize it to be even clearer? Yeah, again, with the kind of the enhanced visualization commands down here, if I click next to the camera, I can then click and select wireframe and then it looks even greater. Um, and then I can actually turn off the points too in this little kind of beam icon right here. See how there's like these, these nine little point buttons, I can turn those off and I can very clearly see um, where everything, uh, there's an issue in my model, um, which is pretty cool. Um, I'm gonna turn back the full model on because I, I do wanna see it, um, but let's just kind of, um, kind of go through a couple fixes here. So the cool thing, the first thing with Stitch is I can click on this edge and you see when it does that, it turns green. So this, this Stitch command is super, super powerful on the backbone of HyperMesh in terms of kind of resolving things and, and resolving issues. Um, it does a really good job of kind of addressing that Stitch command. See if I click on this edge, it's gonna go through it and kind of make that change in terms of stitching. Okay, so that's one tip, take advantage of that Stitch command. Uh, another thing I, I will typically do and split is use the split command. The split command um, is tends to be more advantageous when you're trying to split up edges for, for mesh density, because what you'll see when we start actually meshing our parts um, is that, you know, splitting up your edges, you can kind of control your density. So this split command, um, I can actually just, you know, hover, use the left mouse button, click, and then you see how I have created an edge automatically. So that's going to be an edge where I map um, element density to. The other kind of really cool thing about the interface, and this tended to be kind of a complaint of the old interface, um, was the uh, sometimes the help wasn't super user intuitive. Every command within the new interface, you click on it, it'll kind of tell you how to utilize that command. Um, and also you can kind of click a quick video that shows you how to go through this. So 
I know I'm running through a good bit of tips in this webinar. So um, this is another kind of good reference to kind of come back to in terms of going through that. Um, so a couple other things I'll kind of point out is we kind of see right here, there is another kind of issue. Um, there is a hole where there shouldn't be a hole. Um, this can happen even if you have a good CAD designer. Sometimes things just don't translate coming over to CAE. So you're probably, you're gonna run into this. Those you've been using HyperMesh have, have probably had to fix these gaps before. Um, the patch command has gotten greatly in, in, increased in terms of the capability. So this is a kind of another advantage of jumping to the new interface. So if I click on patch and um, uh, if I click on it and kind of just drag and drop, you see it at, when I do that, and if I hit escape, you see how it automatically stitched the edges together and kind of created that surface perfectly for me, which is really kind of cool. Um, if I do it again, I just want to resolve this. And again, it's just dragging and drop. And HyperMesh is, is smart enough to know where you're kind of going, um, kind of creating that surface, and it'll automatically kind of create that curvature for me. So just in a matter of moments, something that would have been very kind of tricky to do in organic surfacing in CAD, I did it in a couple seconds of resolving that. Um, definitely pretty cool. Um, one other kind of kind of other kind of tip for the most part in terms of geometry, one thing I will recommend is there's actually an automatic way of doing all of this. Um, if you, you may not be familiar with this command, but if you go to the D feature icon and then select batch, and then I can click on all the surfaces. Um, let me just do uh, a box select here. Yep. And then I'm going to grab all the surfaces and it auto clean up. It, it's going to do everything automatically. So you'll see that there are still some red edges, but if I click on stitch, you'll see that if I go to only, it does a pretty good job of fixing everything. So the only red edges, there's like, maybe there's one surface I didn't patch here. That's fine. Uh, but the circles, there's, that makes sense. That should be red. So everything looks very good. And it kind of did that very, very quickly for me. Um, so that's another kind of tip under the D feature icon automatic batch, but you may be doing a combination of stitch and splitting. Um, I'm gonna open up another geometry, another kind of powerful capability is we saw stitching in, an edge to surfaces, but you can also stitch points or lines to additional lines. So what I mean by that, let's open up another model here. Um, a large model here. Um, another kind of uh, cool thing is we can isolate components. Um, you can either hit I on your keyboard or you can right click and hit isolate. And then if I turn on the stitch command again, if I come down here and if I hit, hit uh, show all, um, you kind of see everything here. And what I'm talking about, um, you'll see right here, this kind of isn't ideal. It has this really small kind of breadcrumb right here. And what happens, like I said, HyperMesh um, will generate its element density based off of your edges and your system. Um, so this is an, is an ideal. So what I can do is I can actually hover until I see that how that point gets selected, hold down my left mouse button and drag it to that uh, point and it replaces it and it fully stitches that node into that point. So now I have a straight line. I won't have that small little breadcrumb. And that's kind of a nice advantage too of the stitch command. So you can just drag, drag a, uh, points over um, on stitching. You can also do this on a line. So again, um, I can see this right here. There's kind of a kind of a, a, a T junction line here that I probably don't want it. It's going to kind of create these small little disjointed elements. So what I can do is I can click on that line, drag it until I see the other line highlight into an orange, release, and now I just have one line. So that's a really another powerful capability. So stitching can be done on the individual surfaces. Um, you know, st stitching an edge to a surface, but I can also stitch an, uh, a node to a node and, and an edge to an edge. Great. Um, oh, kind of the last thing I'll point out real quick. Um, let's just kind of show the suppress edge. So if I wanted to suppress an edge here. So what happens now if I suppress an edge, this is also kind of a common, you know, a helpful thing if I escape. You'll notice that the edge is kind of has a construction line view. It's dotted. That means that it's no longer going to map element densities across this edge. So sometimes suppressing edges can be very handy um, in specific applications. Okay, great. Jump back to my PowerPoint slide deck. 
Um, so we talked about geometry capabilities, and obviously that's the tip of the iceberg. There's a number of other commands, but those are some of the key ones I wanted to highlight, specifically stitching um, and kind of that patch surface command, which is super handy. Um, but we're going to transition into meshing now. Um, so uh, one of the great things about um, HyperMesh is the ability to kind of create templates and automate processes. Um, you know, there's a lot of advanced capabilities, but one of the really powerful things is you can kind of automate the mesh flow to make your systems very quick. So one of the things I'll typically do is I'll do what's known as a batch mesh. And the batch mesh is an automatic tool where I can specify um, templates where I can specify how I want to mesh around a fillet or around a washer or a hole, what that element density is going to be, what that element order is going to be. And I can use that template every single time. So if you're in the habit of maybe you work at a company, you know, my previous experience, I worked in the energy industry. Um, our, our, our product um, design was a lot maybe slower than maybe if you work in consumer goods. So a lot of our designs are just slight changes. So it was really handy to me to kind of, when I was working as an analyst to kind of create these templates um, and batch meshing can do that. So that's kind of a first quick tip. I'm going to step you through it. It's fairly easy. So I'm get, you know, if you, if you're familiar with it, it it's probably going to, it's going to be, all right, I understand, but if you've never used it, it's definitely a game changer. So let's hop in to um, uh, batch meshing. So I'm going to open that up. All right, so here's kind of a, you know, it's, a, it's not necessarily an easy part. You know, if I, if I look at it, um, there is some fillets, there's some transitions, um, there is some holes, something that may take some time to work your way through meshing manually. Um, and based on your industry, this might be a, a very common part you run into. So the advantage of the batch mesher is um, it kind of automates that process. So if I go to mesh, um, if I change this to batch mesher, one of the things that um, you know a batch mesher utilizes is it utilizes templates that control kind of the mesh controls under this controls panel right here. So if I click on parameters, and I'll explain what this is, I'm going to open up kind of my um, predefined batch mesh file here. Um, as you see right here, is you can save these templates like you see. I'm hitting the open icon, and I already have a pre-saved parameter file. And this parameter file has controls for the specific elements I want to use, that specific element size. Um, if I'm mid-surfacing, what that's going to be, um, you know, geometry cleanup, um, you know, looking at T connections, it kind of controls everything within your actual specific mesh template. So things that you, if you guys are kind of doing analysis on parts that are fairly familiar, um, this can really save you a lot of time. So. Everything can be customized. Even I can even remove features like logos or threads from your CAD design. It kind of makes it very easy to do that. So I'll hit apply and that's great. So that's our first, that's kind of our controls and our mesh settings. Um, the other thing that's really important is our criteria file here. So if I click on criteria, um, if I hit open, again, I have a predefined criteria. So what, what exactly is the criteria? Criteria is how you kind of measure your mesh quality in a system. So this is going to be, um, you know, where you can identify failures in your model after you mesh it in HyperMesh. You know, minimum size, maximum size, critical things to check would be like aspect ratio and warpage if you're running a traditional, um, just a structural analysis. Um, you even have capabilities for your time step if you're running explicit. So there's ways of specifying these criteria for um, that kind of allow us to kind of uh, make sure our mesh is good quality. So if I hit apply, um, I've now specified my controls and all I need to do is select batch mesher and highlight um, my components. And you see how the mesh icon is grayed out. Um, you know, if I was doing a manual mesh here, I could key in my actual element size, but this template is based off of, this is a generally a pr pretty good element size based off of previous runs. So if I hit mesh, it's gonna automatically mesh and it's gonna control that mesh around the entire kind of system right here. So let me turn off the geometry edges to make this a little bit clear. Um, other kind of cool thing um, with the new interface um, is the ability to just kind of click on icons to hide them. Um, again, I think things were a little bit, um, you had to go through a little bit more mouse button clicks in the old interface. 
So in this case, I want to hide the geometry. I want to keep the, the elements here. So you see right here, this icon showing the surface, that's geometry. Um, and then I just have my element showing. So you kind of see how it, it went through the system, made a pretty good mesh, um, looked at my entire system um, and made sure everything looked good. So one of the things you can check after you create a mesh, and we'll focus some more time on this, um, and we start delving into some manual mesh tips, is once I create a mesh, I can hit edit elements. And this is gonna show me my element quality. So this is based off your parameter and criteria file, specifically the criteria. So if I click on criteria here, um, these are the, these values right here, these limits are based off the criteria file I specified. So if I come back to mesh, you know, this criteria file, um, see how these are all my limits I've specified. So you can actually ascertain or look at your actual model and say, all right, um, how's my actual quality? Um, and then I can actually individually click on each of, each of these components as well. So I can click on aspect ratio. And in this case, it's a pretty good model. Um, generally aspect ratio is less than five. It's a pretty good mesh quality, but I could move the slider to the left. You kind of see where some elements have higher aspect ratios, but they're still pretty small, like less than two. Uh, but this really helps you understand. You can click on any of these components, like click on warp. If I want to go back to the main menu, I just need to click on the icon. It brings me back. So this is also really nice in terms of being able to ascertain your quality and understand if there's any specific issues in the system. Great. So I'm going to jump back to my slide deck. Um, okay. So we'll jump in now into actually delving into some 2D meshing. So you're probably your first workflow. Like if you're not using batch meshing, I, I recommend you start doing it um, because it's going to save time. And you know you may be used to just doing manual meshing, and that's great. But batch meshing can kind of automate that workflow, and you can always go back after you batch mesh and do manual meshing. So some of the like the nice kind of changes in the interface, um, it kind of like all these a lot of these commands, um, you know you know, uh, weren't easily accessible. Um, now they're very easily accessible and there's even some further enhancements of how they function. So these are 2D meshing commands that allow you to kind of manually manipulate elements and nodes. One of the really cool things about HyperMesh is its ability to kind of really anywhere in the model, you can kind of control that mesh. Like I can delete elements, I can move nodes, I can smooth nodes, I can split nodes. And so um, these are some of the tools we'll jump into. Um, and some specific tips I try to utilize when I'm trying to kind of go through manual mesh manipulation. Um, so let me open that up. I'll open. All right, so it's a model that's already been meshed. Um, but one of the things I'll typically do is after I mesh it is I'll, I'll go to my elements panel here. So the mesh, you know, here you kind of have our 2D mesh and 1D mesh, and then even a 3D mesh if it was a, a volume. But I'll go to my elements panel or ribbon right here. And if I click on edit elements, it's going to show me that element quality. So initially I can I can see directly that, hey, there's some issues in the system. You know, anything in red is not the best element quality. And that again, that's based off of what we talked about previously on our parameters and criteria. Um, so if I step my way through some of these commands, some tip some tips um, and I'll kind of do a really nice shortcut tip at the end as well to kind of point out to you guys. Uh, but uh, one thing we can do is I'm gonna first start with the smooth command. So again, um, if you're coming back to this later watching this, um, you can go back um, on any of these icons and click on the video. It's gonna show you what it does um, and it's gonna highlight what, what functionality it is, but I'm actually going to show you. So smoothing, what it does is it looks at any kind of disjointed elements and tries to smooth it out to be kind of a, a smooth tria or a smooth quad. So if I zoom in on this, this location right here, I, I notice I have some disjointed elements. So if I do a box select here and then I hit smooth, see how it, it really just smoothed everything out. Super, super handy, um, really can kind of fix some areas. Obviously, this, this uh, quad here isn't perfect, but it's definitely a lot better than what it was. Um, so very handy. You could potentially go through most of this model and use the smooth command, and it probably would fix most of the poor element quality issues. But I want to kind of highlight some of the other tools. Um, so the move command, 
Um, how it functions um, is if I click on it, you can actually drag um, nodes and holes or even move trias. So we'll, sh we'll show a couple of cool things within this command. It's actually much more powerful than at first glance. Most people just think it's just, you know, I click on a node and I can drag it, which is great. And you kind of see when I do that, the element quality adjusts. But one of the cool things you can do is you can double click and it will automatically optimize the systems. Um, so if I if I hit Control Z, you notice that this element is poor element quality. So left double mouse button optimizes it. And again, there's a whole bunch of commands here, but this is one of the tips I use a lot is I use the left double mouse button and it optimizes. It's going to move the entire elements nodes to make it a good quality. So I can double click on a lot of these. Um, it, it's not perfect, but if I did it again, it actually resolved it. So that's something that's super, super cool. Um, the, the, mount, the dragging the nodes can be also be very handy. Um, so you click on a node and drags it. But one of the other cool things I do, um, even if I, you know, something I do a lot for stress analysis um, is I don't like having trias really close to, um, you know, a washer or circle. You know, you may ask, you know, Drew, you know, why don't I just make things as all quads? And I can go that route, but sometimes if I make things all quads, you know, and not mixed, which mixed is the default in HyperMesh, um, it may have a lot more elements than necessary, or it may take longer to, to mesh. So I try to use mixed. So say if you're using mixed, what I can actually do is I can click on the quad and then just move my mouse button down and I drag it all the way down. So a couple things you'll note. One, I move the tria away from the actual washer, which is good from a stress concentration perspective. I don't, I like having quad elements around the system, but you'll also note that by moving it away, it became, you know, it kind of automatically adjusted the element to be a lot nicer in terms of uh, element quality. So that's another powerful command. So definitely this move, move tool, I think is an underused uh, a tool in terms of tips of an hypermesh. I think it's definitely super, super handy to take advantage of. Um, so we'll go to the next icon here, which is split. Um, kind of pretty pretty intuitive. If I if I click on it, it's going to split an element in half. Um, if I hold the shift button, it's going to bring that back. If I split a quad into two trias, it's going to move it back to a quad. Um, but a couple kind of cool things about it is I can go um, if I'm working in 2022 interface. Um, it, uh, so if I click on this little drop down box, select graphical lines. I can actually create a line right here. It's split. Kind of see how it automatically applies that line here to that that split. So this is a little bit different than the split command within geometry. Um, split geometry command, um, it does it by kind of like a node point to a node point. And I kind of screwed everything up. But this goes by element in terms of that, that, that little line tool I created. So let me come back here. So that's also pretty handy. Um, one of the other kind of cool things you can do with it um, is you can also change it to an element. Um, so, you know, element selection here. So I'm gonna go to element selection and then I can just click on one individual element and it's gonna automatically split it in two. So the default, when you use this command, it's, it's going off of like the algorithm and it kind of, sometimes it doesn't always pick the most optimum splitting. Um, I don't use this, this tool a ton, but sometimes it can be kind of handy in terms of splitting if you have some really weird disjointed elements. Um, so uh, one command I do use a lot is the next command over is also replacing a node. Um, so if I do that here, so I click to replace, this actually allows you to move one node to another. You can, actually can replace multiple nodes, but I'll just show on the example right here, just one to one. Um, so if I click, I wanna replace this node and move it up to here. It's gonna ask me, hey, you're gonna kind of modify an element. Is that okay? I'm gonna hit yes. See how it did that? It got rid of that, that tria. Obviously it made a tria here, but they all went from yellow to red to kind of a nice kind of color, um, kind of meeting an element quality. So there's some handy dandy features you can do here. Um, next feature, if I go to density, I think I'm guessing most of you guys have used this, but if you haven't, um, you know, uh, one thing after you, after you batch mesh, you know, this is a way of being able to actually kind of adjust density on element edges. So I can click on an edge here and I can increase the quality and it's automatically going to update everything, you know, surrounding. So if you see how I increase that, that can also benefit the system in terms of what that quality is going to be. 
Kind of the last thing I'll point out here. So remapping, I'm not going to talk about that in today's webinar. Um, it's it's just if you want to remap, you know, nodes around lines, and that, there is a usefulness to that. Uh, but one of the things I will do a lot is sometimes when I bring in files from a designer or what have you, or you know, like I, I happen all the time, you know, um, in the energy industry where I worked, um, it would be there'd be just issues with just random geometry missing or, or places. So we talked about the patch tool, but there's also an element creation tool. So if I'm not doing it on the geometry end, um, I can also do it after the mesh has been created. So I can actually create an element. And so I can go here and you see I've created that element. So that's also super handy. Um, that allows you to kind of create that element automatically. Now, one, one kind of like, you know, I showed you all the manual mesh manipulation tools. There's actually a, a bunch of others. Again, I can't get into everything, but another really good tip, similar to the geometry kind of batch defeature tool, um, there's another tool um, within the elements where if I actually click on auto quality, I can grab all the elements, select them and specify auto quality. Um, I'm hit continue. And it does, it's, you see right here down at the taskbar, it's going through that command, showing me the process. It's actually telling me it, it added some elements. If I go to edit element now, you see that it, it, it let me exit this command, hit escape. You see that it actually fixed a lot of the geometry. It's not perfect, but it saves me a lot of time. And actually I can go back and, and even readjust the element, uh, element quality again. It's kind of a cyclical thing. I, I can keep doing it. Um, and it's going to kind of adjust that quality. So again, if I go to edit elements now, you kind of see it kind of fixed a few other items. So it's super handy. I would say like my workflow, typically when I go through this, if I have like computational space to spare, like this is a sheet metal model and it's like only 5,000 elements, I'll use that auto quality tool and then I'll go through mesh manipulation. I know some of you guys are working with very large assemblies. You have to be cognizant of your, your element count. So that might be a, an instance where use batch meshing and then editing the elements accordingly. Okay, great. I'm gonna jump back into my PowerPoint. Kind of one last quick tech tip to show um, is morphing. So we're talking about meshing here. Um, specifically, one of the other really powerful features of HyperMesh is the ability to morph. Um, if you're unfamiliar with morphing, um, what it allows you to do is rather than, you know, say you, you determine um, you run your case and you want to sort of adjust a surface, you know, typically what the old school way would be is you'd have to go back to your CAD designer or go to your CAD tool and readjust the surface. Or even in HyperMesh, you'd have, you can actually create surfaces, you'd have to go back and adjust the surface and then you'd have to go remesh it. Morphing, what it allows you to do is actually allows you to drag an existing mesh and kind of uh, morph the system. Um, so I'm gonna talk about free morphing, which is kind of based around nodal morphing and then moving it around. Uh, I just wanna kind of lay out, there's other morphing options like proximity morphing, um, where it kind of looks around specific faces or edges and kind of morphs the entire mesh of that face. And then volume morphing, which is based around a cage. You kind of see these cages right here and everything within that cage gets morphed. So I'm gonna jump into a morphing example, just a morphing tip. Okay, great. So I think the other kind of cool thing about how the new interface is set up, it kind of has a left to right workflow. So you kind of see right here, you can start out with your sketch, you go to your geometry, mesh, elements, assembly, and you see morphing is a little bit down. You know, this is after you've kind of already set up your model. This is typically when people will morph a system. So I already have a mesh um, set up um, and I actually want to morph this. So what I actually want to do is I specifically want to kind of adjust these top edges, kind of make it a little bit taller. So I'm going to click on free morphing. Um, and what I'll actually do, here's kind of another command. Some of you guys probably legacy HyperMesh users, you might know this, this keyboard shortcut, but um, if, you if I'm trying to grab a lot of nodes, I can actually do it very quickly if I hold the Alt, uh, alt button down and follow the geometry here. So I'm just holding the Alt button down. Uh, the reason why I don't go from like one edge to here, it may grab kind of the interior nodes, but it 
the alt button, what it does, it's, it's, it follows a path profile. So it's following the, the path profile and because there's like a, a kind of like a vertical edge here, an arc, it, I'm, I'm kind of going in, in portions, but it is saving me time in terms of selection. Um, I'm also going to grab the interior here. So I, I want to kind of, and what I'm actually grabbing right here, the first kind of workflow of morphing is asking for the nodes you want to morph or move. Um, so this is important to note. But by default, um, the new interface kind of keeps it very, very simple. Um, and the fact that it's going to try and look for every other node and, it, you know, and morphing that the other nodes are known as anchors. The anchors are what stay in place when you morph it. But one, one tip I'll point out is um, sometimes I may want to kind of, you know, I don't want to keep everything as rigid as possible. Um, maybe I want to just lock the entire bottom face. So I can uncheck automatic. And then what I can do is I can click and change this to faces and then grab the bottom faces. Um, so now um, it's those are the only things that are being locked in place. Um, obviously, I'm moving these nodes, and as these nodes move, it's going to kind of drag the other nodes in relation to these, you know. But if I actually um, kind of move things up, you kind of see how I'm dragging everything. You know, initially, if I would have went off the automatic, it would have kept these kind of um, dividers fixed in place. So that's kind of another tip: be aware of the automatic. Um, you can turn that option off. Um, and as far as if you're unfamiliar with morphing, you kind of see I have a lot of ways I can morph these, I can move these around, I can actually even rotate them. Um, so there is a lot of flexibility in terms of kind of working through and adjusting these accordingly. Great. And when I exit, you kind of see right there, um, I've generated, you know, kind of a little bit taller of a height. Again, these are things that are, you know, very, very nice things about HyperMesh that save you time. You know, old ways of doing things in terms of surfacing. Um, you know, you can still do that, but a lot of you guys are doing lots of analyses and you're trying to, you know, be as uh, as good of a user as possible. So if you've never used morphing, to take a look into it, it can be very, very advantageous in terms of um, uh, kind of saving time. Okay, so hop back into PowerPoint here. So we're almost at, at the end of our webinar. Um, I'm gonna kind of turn it over to you guys if any questions. The one thing I will point out, we are doing these webinars, uh, more tip-based webinars up and through the end of the year. So next month I'm gonna be running one, I believe it's on OptiStruct. Um, and then, but you can check just our, our socials to see that event coming up. Um, and then the other thing to keep in mind, um, myself and the other engineers here at True Insight, we're always working on new content for blogs and videos. So check out our blog, um, check out our YouTube. Um, and I just wanna thank you all for attending this afternoon. I will stick around in the chat if anybody has any questions that my colleague didn't answer. <laughs>